My name is Bill Ross. Uh, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up there. I uh, went to Columbia College, and actually, I got a <clears throat> got my BA and my master's and my PhD all at Columbia in physics. Okay. I actually took one course as an undergraduate, an advanced course in cell physiology, taught by a man who was actually well known here at the MBL. His name was uh, Teru Hayashi. Uh, he taught in the cell physiology course, or rather the physiology course here for many years. But at the time when, when I took that course at Columbia, I didn't know anything about that. But he was a really inspiring teacher. And at some point when I decided not to do physics anymore, I remembered the sort of ideas and the inspiration from his course. And that led me through a series of steps which are a bit idiosyncratic and uh, random and lucky. I ended up in a laboratory <clears throat> that was beginning to do neuroscience. So it was by a man named Cy Leventhal. Uh, he also has some association with the MBL. And while I was in his lab, uh, I had the opportunity to come here to the MBL to take the neurobiology course. And that was both an introduction to the MBL and an introduction to neurobiology. At the time, I was just winging it. Uh, I, liked, I thought, I'll do something different. Well, what happened, and that was the beginning of my sort of uh, lucky things, while I took that course uh, here at the MBL, I met a number of scientists, one of whom was Larry Cohen. And he was doing a sort of neuroscience, but with a kind of a technical approach to things. And so he was interested in getting people in his laboratory who were not just biologists, but who were maybe had some facility with uh, technical and optical things. And he had already had one other person in his lab with that background, and he was happy with that. So I met him, and uh, then I joined his laboratory and uh, spent, came back a couple of summers here as a researcher in his lab, as a postdoc, uh, even though I didn't know any biology or neuroscience. I, was, I had a PhD, so I was a postdoc. And uh, so that was a, an entree into things. So we worked on squid axons uh, here at the MBL for two summers. And then I had the opportunity after that to join uh, Ann Stewart's laboratory at Harvard uh, Neurobiology. And she also worked in, on sea animals. You know, obviously, the squid's a sea animal. Uh, she was working on barnacles. And uh, even though we were mostly working at Harvard in the summer, uh, we came down here to Woods Hole. And so I was working in her laboratory for a couple of summers here at the MBL. Uh, I, I continued to work on sea animals, both uh, barnacles and then in collaboration with another scientist, uh, worked on crabs. And it, at that point, the second advantage of the MBL began to uh, show itself. I mean, not just, well, actually the third. The first was the courses. Uh, the second was the uh, marine animals. But the third was that this, and this, as the years went on, became more and more significant for me, is the MBL became a place where we could make collaborations. So the, the, the person, Catherine Graubart from the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, came and worked two summers with me here at the MBL on crabs. And this was a great opportunity uh, for both of us. And it was easy to work out uh, the sort of personal situations here at the MBL, because there was housing and dormitories, things like that. It was easy. It would have been much more difficult to do that back in New York, where I am, for a visitor to come for any extended period of time. Well, there were, again, a few random things. Uh, I remember being very inspired by a visit to the Museum of Natural History and the Hayden Planetarium. I was just totally blown away by that. Uh, and then in school I was very good at mathematics and 
it was a lot of fun to do mathematics. And so between the sort of inspiration of uh, a few events like going to museums and uh, the sort of fun of doing mathematics that sort of led me into uh, being a math and physics major in high school and then in college. The laboratory has always had marine organisms as a key component of uh, the research here. Uh, but in terms of neuroscience, uh, I think there's been a little bit of a drift away from that. Not completely. There's still a number of people who work on uh, squid synapses and other uh, squid issues. Uh, but most of the neuroscience is uh, not done on uh, those animals anymore. There's a reason for that. That is, the, the squid axon and the squid synapse were meant to be sort of examples of the, the basic sort of building blocks of the nervous system. And with time, people felt that they pretty much understood those simple building blocks pretty well. Of course, in biology, it's never true that you completely understand everything, but that no longer became a sort of uh, attraction for people to work on squid axons and squid synapses, with some exceptions. Okay, so neurobiology has changed in that sense. Yeah, and also, so there was another kind of theme that was very popular in, the, let's say, the 70s and 80s uh, when I was getting into neuroscience. and. Uh, some of that was expressed here at the MBL, and that was that a simple organism uh, could be a means to understanding the brain. That is, the human brain or even the brain of a mouse or a rat is too complicated. So let's try to find a simple organism. So people worked on a plesia, okay, and of course that was very po popular. Some of it was done here at Woods Hole. Uh, some of the work that I did on crab was motivated by that same idea that uh, a, a simple nervous system might reveal uh, uh, ideas and themes that could at some point in the future be applicable to understanding higher ner nervous systems. Uh, so there were an a lot of animals that were done. There was crabs, there was lobster, there was the leech, there was a plesia, snail, and a whole host of, and even today this is uh, continued, but not with those animals so much anymore. It's more continued with, let's say, Drosophila or uh, the nematode, and that's largely because these animals can, uh, modern genetics and molecular biological tools can apl be applied to them. Much harder to do that with these sea animals and others that I mentioned. That is, I was here, uh, this is after I had my own laboratory, but I was still, had some project with Ann Stewart, who I mentioned I worked with, and we had a laboratory in what was the Whitman building at that time, and it was a relatively big laboratory, so we shared it with another group that included John Lisman and a man named uh, uh, Dan Johnston, okay, and uh, we were working on barnacles, they were working on uh, hippocampus in the rat. And they came together here at the MBL because it was a great place to collaborate. Uh, at that time, there were very few laboratories that were working on rats. Okay. But each of them in, in their own time had spent some time at the MBL, knew that it was a good place to do science and to collaborate. And so they arranged to come here and work on a project uh, together. And we were sharing this laboratory, which happens sometimes here at the MBL. And we got to talking after a while about our respective projects. And we realized that we could put something together as these things often happen. Anyway, we did that. Uh, it was very productive uh, collaboration. A couple of very high profile papers came out of that. And uh, I think that collaboration in its own way uh, shaped both the directions that I took afterwards and some of the directions that uh, those scientists uh, took. Uh, 
I'm still, to some extent, following up on some of the basic ideas that that initial collaboration with Dan Johnson and John Lisman that we started here around 1989 or so, I think we began that. So that would be 25 years ago. And the idea is to understand uh, dendrites of neurons, particularly in uh, brain slices uh, from rat and sometimes from mouse. And the, uh, uh, we've, about 25 years ago or so, the general idea was that uh, the dendrites were uh, not so important. Uh, or maybe I shouldn't quite put it like that, but just that they didn't do that many interesting things. They were thought to be just the places where the inputs to the cell came, and then they just were gathered up and the cell fired active potentials. And we began to find, using uh, some of the techniques that we had developed, uh, optical techniques, that we could look at the dendrites uh, uh, with the optical techniques and begin there were also other techniques that were being used, uh, but we, with a combination of techniques, we could look at the dendrites and explore their complexity. And uh, that's been uh, the main uh, 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 sort of path that I've followed since then. There have been a couple of side projects uh, of, you know, kind of amusement or just for the fun of collaboration uh, and opportunities, uh, but that's certainly been the main theme of my work uh, since. There were camps that the MBL ran. Uh, there was a, at three levels, you might say. There was a, sort of for very young kids uh, called the Periwinkle Club that used to sort of sit in the memorial circle. Uh, I think it might still be there. I'm not 100% certain about that. Uh, my kids are now long grown up. And then for a little bit older kids, there was a satellite club uh, that was worked out of the MBL club here in, in town. Uh, and they had some ancillary activities like uh, folk singing and stuff like that, that the kids all left. And then of course there was uh, the, the, um, the, the Children's Science School, which was not officially part of the MBL, but many of the children of the scientists went to, uh, to that. And that, that was a great introduction. You probably know something about that. They take the kids, they go on field trips into the water, they really get their hands dirty in, uh, in, in the scientific environment around here. And kids always remember that. Uh, uh, largely because uh, of the collaborations that I still am able to do here. But at a certain point, it also, uh, the MBL became sort of into the bloodstream. And uh, so we like to come back because uh, I've raised three children who all uh, have enjoyed their summers at, in Woods Hole. And they like to come back. Uh, so there's some additional motivation over and above the pure science uh, for coming back. And then, of course, we feel some attachment to the community and want to help motivate the next generation and all these other things that come when you've been in an institution for some period of time. So the, there's a group of us who sort of work in optical techniques and we've some years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we kind of self-organized into what we call the neuroimaging cluster. And this includes some of the people that I mentioned, that includes Rodolfo and George Augustine. Larry Cohen, myself, a few others who are not there. And so we have a seminar series on Thursday nights. Uh, and then we also have one Tuesdays at lunch. Uh, and occasionally I talk in, uh, in those things and participate in organizing those things.